Welcome to the Elisa Childers podcast, where we equip Christians to identify the core beliefs of historic Christianity, discern its counterfeits, and proclaim the gospel with clarity, kindness, and truth. And we're back with another midweek episode, and today's show is all about the complementarian egalitarian debate. So I have to say, of all the questions I'm asked when I speak at conferences and the questions that come through the website— Questions surrounding this issue are in the top three. I think I get asked about this more than anything else, uh, almost in every live stream. And so I've answered it a few other times, kind of here and there, but we'll compile everything into this one episode because I have, I think, three or four questions that came in through the website that all have to do with this issue and kind of touch on different aspects of this issue. So what I want to do right off the bat is recommend to you Mike Winger's series on women in ministry. I think that it is probably, in my view, the most thorough and the most, um, gosh, thoughtful, biblical treatment of this topic. So I really want to recommend Mike Winger. Now, it's a lot of hours. There are videos that are 14 plus hours. Um, but I believe that the end, he kind of summed up his views and you can dig deeper. And he goes through all the passages of scripture, all of the egalitarian debates, the complementarian debates. And it is really informative. And it will, it, I mean, Mike Winger is a gift to the body of Christ. So check that out for sure if you're really interested in this topic and you want to learn more. And I generally agree with Mike on his conclusions. But let me just define the terms to start with in case anybody doesn't know what these words mean. So uh, complementarian is the view that men and women were both created in the image of God, created equal in dignity, value, and worth, but have different roles to play in the home and in the church. The egalitarian view teaches that men and women are both created in the image of God, equal in dignity, value, and worth, but are interchangeable in their the roles they play in the church and in the home. Now, with those definitions, there's a spectrum between them. So the hard, what I've just described would be like the hard complementarian, hard egalitarian. So you could have somebody that's more on the complementarian side that would say that it's never okay for a woman to ever speak in church at all. Uh, then you might have somebody a little bit on this side of the spectrum that would say, well, it's all right for a woman to get up and read the Bible passage before the sermon, but not give the sermon. Then you have complementarians that might say it's okay for a woman to lead worship and to say some words between the songs. Um, and then you still might even have people more in the middle of the spectrum that are kind of straddling both sides that might say, well, we don't ordain women as senior pastors, but we let women preach the sermons. And then you get on towards the spectrum of egalitarianism, and you might find that maybe they still believe that men are the head of the home, but women can be pastors in the church, and then all the way up to the maybe most, you know, extreme version of egalitarianism where there's just absolutely no difference at all. So I want to acknowledge that there's this as a spectrum. And so this is a question that I've given quite a bit of thought to. I've talked with my husband about it, my pastor, the head of my seminary. Um, and I am in thinking through some of the passages of Scripture about this. I actually don't think it comes down to one or two scriptures for me. I affirm everything that Paul teaches about women, and I affirm it, and I think it's good. And that's because I think that when you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, what you see is it is so important how the sexes interact with one another, because right in the beginning, you have God making men and women in his image. And I, I, I've said this before, but you know, if you think about even your body systems, you have a complete circulatory system, you have a complete nervous system, you have a complete cardiovascular system, but you only have one half of a reproductive system. So it takes a male and a female to make a complete reproductive system. And the purpose, of course, is to produce a child, right? This is where kids come from. Birds and the bees didn't know, didn't bet you didn't think you were going to get that on today's podcast. But the point being that that should tell us a lot, just the way our bodies are. That should tell us a lot about God's intention for male and female. So women's bodies, now, of course, there are always exceptions. There are people who never get married. There are women who are barren, of course. But we're talking about the normative, uh, the normative way that God created us with the creation mandate to be fruitful and multiply. That is the mandate of creation. That is what we're supposed to be doing here is be fruitful and multiply. And of course, as God set that up within the institution of marriage being between one man and one woman. And that is what 
it, this is just should be obvious from reading those scriptures that that's what's best for the child. Well, now if you think about the way our bodies are made, uh, a woman can carry a baby, birth a baby, and feed a baby just with her body. So that would hint at the fact that it is probably God's design for the woman to be the primary nurturer of the child, especially when the ch children are younger and more dependent. Um, and this is, in my view, a beautiful gift. I, I think that this is something that is not, I, I think modern feminism has poisoned our minds to kind of see that as an oppression or some sort of a, a drag or something we do after we do everything else in our lives. But actually, I think that that is an honor that God bestowed upon women that, and, and our bodies should tell us that our bodies, just the design of our bodies should tell us that it is very important to God that when men and women are not interchangeable, that children need a mother and they need a father. We know even scientifically that chemicals that are released in children's brains are released with the mother um, with cuddling. They're released with the father through playing. So, the, And this is what they call the bonding hormone. So that even like the chemicals in our body, the way God created us, lend itself to see the beauty of the differences of the sexes. Now, with those differences, there's going to be strengths and there's going to be weaknesses. And because of that, that is why I think that God instituted there to be differences in the way we interact with one another in the home and in the church and in society, too. So I think that um, those differences are important. And so when Paul says, I do not permit a woman to speak or have authority over a man, there are other places in Scripture where he does let women speak. He lets them prophesy with their heads covered. Um, so it's clear to me that Paul isn't saying a woman can never talk in church, but the point for Paul was authority. So I don't think women should have spiritual authority over men, which means I don't think, I, I hold to the complementarian view that women should not be pastors. Now listen, if you're a female pastor and you're listening to this, I don't think this is something that disqualifies you from having salvation. Like this is, um, there are some, some ways of talking about this that can be confusing and very hard, and some of the scriptures are difficult. Um, but I do think that what God has designed is for there to be male leadership in the church and in the home. And I mean, I can just speculate as to why that is. I think as we see in nature, women are more inclined toward individuals. We're naturally more, I think, empathetic and have more of an ability to discern emotions in other people. And um, I think those are all strengths. But because of that, I think there can be reasons why maybe it's better for men to be leading the community of, of churchgoers and be leading the home because men tend to be more focused on, on groups and um, what's best for the group. I think even C.S. Lewis talks about this in Mere Christianity. Uh, but so when Paul says that, uh, he obviously does let women talk, but I think the issue was authority. And so I don't think women should be preaching the sermon on Sundays. I think the exhortation of the church, the teaching of the Word of God should be male. Uh, I think that's why when I'm invited to take a pulpit on a Sunday morning, I will decline that. I will... Um, I, I'm open to doing an interview if the pastor's up on the stage. There's no perception of authority with me. If I speak at a conference, again, the context for Paul's command was in the context of church government. So conferences aren't necessarily under church government. When people come to conferences, there's no sort of hint or suggestion that the people who are speaking at the conference are authoritative voices in their lives. You can take what I say or leave it. So I will accept invitations to speak where there's even mixed audiences. Um, but the way I look at it is I try to err on the side of being careful. So if I'm unclear or it's a super gray area, I will probably opt to not do it because I am not looking for my seat at the table. I don't want to do what men do. I want to do what women do. I want I want to be the best woman I can be. I don't think being a man and doing what men do is being the best woman, despite what feminism tells us, because feminism has made what men do the standard of good. And I think that's backwards. So um, that's kind of my view. That's why I will speak at conferences, uh, but I'll decline Sunday morning pulpits. And I really try to, to keep this in check. And of course, I'm accountable to my husband and my pastor. And, uh, and, and others in my life who have been given permission to speak into my life 
on these topics. So that's kind of where I'm coming at with just the definition. And that was a lot to get into the questions. So um, that actually answers the first question, which is, is it biblical for women to be head pastors, elders? I'm not convinced either way. And I don't think women head pastors are evil, but I struggle to see how the Bible promotes it, even though there are clearly women leaders like Deborah and Phoebe. Yeah, so I I do. I love some of these strong women in the Bible that are very inspiring to me. Um, I definitely um, think that that we have very clear instructions about elders in the church. These are to be men. There there are very specific qualifications. They're to be um, men. They have one wife. They're not to be given to much wine. They're not to be abusive or quick to anger. They're supposed to be able to teach good doctrine and refute those who oppose good doctrine. Those are all qualifications of leaders, and they are in reference to men. So I don't think women should be church elders or pastors in churches. Um, so, so my answer to that would be, no, I don't think that it's biblical. And uh, that's, that's just my, my view. Now, here's another question regarding this topic. How seriously would you take issues related to egalitarian and complementarianism? And here's the the rest of the question here. My family joined a new church about 10 years ago. About three years ago, our church named some women as pastors in roles like kids pastor, evangelism pastor, etc. Last year, one of these pastors preached a full sermon on Sunday morning and on a few occasions has preached the last 10 minutes or so of the pastor's regular sermon. I'm not against women at all, even in certain ministry areas, but I believe that their stance on this particular issue is not the correct one. In all the other issues, they seem to be decently solid. They preach the gospel and have spoken out against abortion and LGBTQ and transgender issues. I'm not sure how seriously to take this. If it would just be me, it would be simple. My kids are pretty involved, though, and I'm not sure everyone in my house agrees that what they are doing is wrong. I'm praying about uh, what we should do. Uh, I would love to hear your perspective if you have time since you came out of an egalitarian background. Well, okay, so this question is really going to depend on who's asking. Because if this is a male, if you're the head of your home and you're asking this question, then my encouragement to you would be to lead your family to a church that has a biblical stance on this, especially if it's your conviction that they have not been practicing biblical um, practices in this area. So if this is a if this is a husband who's asking this question, my advice to you would be to lead your home. Now, I get that the kids are really involved and that's hard. And it doesn't have to be something like super quick that you jerk them out. There could be even a way you start having Bible studies as a family. Maybe bring your family along. Look at some passages of scripture about how the church is supposed to be run. And, um, you know, I'll be praying for you that you will lead your family well in this area. Now, if this is a wife asking, my advice to you, if you're if you're the wife, would be to start bringing these issues up with your husband. Because I've often said that biblically faithful Christians can agree to disagree on this issue, but it's not a minor issue. It's a serious issue. It's not a primary. It's not going to affect your salvation, in my opinion. But it's a serious issue that could be in serious error. So if you're the wife, my advice to you would be to humbly bring your concerns to your husband, share some passages of scripture, share the conviction of your heart. And if your your husband is doing his role, if he's loving you like Christ loved the church, laying his life down for you and respecting you, he will listen to you. And, um, you know, maybe I would, I would recommend you pray, bullet, whoever's asking this, pray for your family. And um, so if you're the wife, you come to your husband humbly with your concerns and, and you can keep, you know, keep bringing it up with, with, showing your husband passages of scripture and why this matters to you and why this is important to you. And then you guys can make a decision. Um, but I think this is a good question. It's something that needs to be thought through because even though it may not be a salvation issue, it will affect where you decide to fellowship and go to church. I personally would not feel comfortable attending a church that had female pastors or female preachers in the pulpit on Sunday morning. Okay. Um, here is the final question that we'll deal with today. And that is, I am 17 years old, and I have recently been wrestling with the Lord about the role of women in the church. I believe that God has shown me that I have the gift of teaching, but my church does not have avenues for me to utilize this gift. So my question really is, how can I use my gift but still be within the role of women in the church? And follow-up question, what are your views on head coverings, and how do you discern when to wear it or not? Thank you so much for your time. Okay, I'm going to 
I'm going to wait on answering the head coverings one because I actually need to investigate that one a little bit more. Um, I know Mike Winger has done a really long episode on head coverings. I haven't had a chance to listen to the whole thing, so I'm going to I'm going to just withhold my answer on that one. But I do want to address the other part of your question. Um, so first of all, I love that you are 17 and you are pursuing the Lord and that you see this gift that he's given you, the gift of teaching. I praise God for that in your life. Um, but you said your church does not have avenues for you to utilize this gift. Okay, well, at 17 years old, here's my question. Um, it, are there opportunities for you to speak to the girls in your youth group? Are there opportunities for you to teach a kid's class? Now, I know that feminism wants us to believe, you and me as women, they want us to believe that, oh, just teaching the kids, that's like, pff, that's lower. I'd want to teach the men. I don't think that there is a more audience that I would be more honored to teach than children. God is entrusting, when, when we talked about our bodies and how they're designed, and for the woman to be really the first nurturer and really teacher and, and person that is so close with each new baby, that essentially means that God is trusting women with all the new men that come along. So every little boy that's in that class, every little girl will look at you and you have the opportunity, if this is something your church provides that you might be able to teach the young people, you have the opportunity to teach children who are still malleable. They're still being formed. You're not all hard-headed like the adult people that you might be wanting to teach. But I would encourage you to see teaching within the biblical paradigm, maybe teaching other women, teaching kids as being something that's a great honor. It's not something that is making you a second-class citizen or something that's less important. In fact, I could argue that in some ways it's more important. And so um, if, if your church truly has no opportunity for you to practice this gift, maybe with children or with other girls in your youth group, then I would encourage you to just practice at home make, you know, make some Bible studies that you could give, develop these things. You have time right now to really study the Word. And that's the thing I would encourage you to do as well. At 17 years old, and you have the gift of teaching, that's great, but you got to have the information and the knowledge and the wisdom to really be able to make that gift everything that it should be. So you have time right now. You know, there's no pressure on you right now to go teach anybody. But grow in knowledge, grow in your knowledge of the Word of God, study the Bible, study, 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 study like crazy right now. And I guarantee you that if you study and there are things that God is putting on your heart to, to teach, that their opportunities will come as your life develops. But part of that's going to be developing your character, that's going to be developing your integrity, developing your, your knowledge and your even your teaching skills. And so I would just encourage you at 17 to take this as a time when you still have the opportunity to be not really out there doing it, but you can you can gain that wealth of knowledge so that when it's time, that can just flow out and that gift of teaching will just hit that knowledge and it will be such a beautiful thing. So I'll be praying for you with that. And I hope that's helpful to you. And I hope this episode was helpful. And let's remember that as we pursue Christ, let's keep a sharp mind, a soft heart, and a thick skin. We'll see you next time. So